Hello my loves and welcome back to Strange Playgrounds. Now I was following a Twitter thread recently by uh, one of my fellow writers in the uh, the sort of independent small press horror community and they were talking about how odd it is when they go back to their own work after you know after a time has passed so they become unfamiliar with it so that they've they've developed some degree of critical distance from it um i won't say objective because i hate that word i find the notion of objectivity to be absurd i don't think there's any such thing um given the entirely subjective nature of our appreciation and engagement with what we call reality um whatever whatever even that means for that matter i find the notion of objectivity to be positively absurd um beyond a, a degree of delusion but uh, uh, when a writer has put some sort of critical distance between themselves and their work, and that tends to happen after you put it down, after you've finished with it, and after you've sort of put it away in a drawer for a while, um, or after it's published for that matter, I find after something has gone through all the processes of being redrafted and edited and poured through and pared through and rewritten and tweaked and surgically altered and nipped and tucked when it's gone to the publishers and it's out there is this kind of ah oh, feeling because it's gone it's done you you get sick to death of the fucking sight of it after a while you actually lose all i find anyway you lose all ability to assess it because you're you become blind you become you go over the stories or the the paragraphs or the words so much that you become blind to them and you can't possibly critically assess them anymore so you need to put that distance between yourself and it but when you've come back to work after a long time what this writer was expressing was sincere surprise that they discovered that they were expressing things through their writing that they weren't consciously aware of that there were issues in their lives at the time that they did not consciously intend to explore or express through their writing, but which came through anyway on a sort of subtextual level. They recorded and explored it in a, an unconscious manner. Um, and I find that absolutely fascinating. For me, that's where the hidden resonance of work comes from. That's where the, the, the unseen texture and music of stories actually comes from. When you're not really aware of what you're writing or why, but there there are things that are just surging up and coming through in the spaces between words. There are invisible marks and stains between the words, the syllables, the punctuation. And it's that stuff, it's that stuff I find that, that really gives work its resonance. That's the kind of stuff that people sense when they read it. Whether they can articulate it to themselves or not, that's the substance of it. That's the soul. And that's what people respond to, I find. When I've gotten feedback feedback on my own work from people and they've expressed stuff that I haven't consciously seen but when I've gone back to reread it is definitely there that's the stuff that seems to resonate the strongest that's the stuff that seems to create the strongest connections and I think it's because it's sincere it's so sincere it's beyond all contrivance you know it's something that occurs utterly unconsciously in a state of almost self-hypnotism um where it's it's uncolored by agenda or bias or um conscious intention it's just something that you need to express at the time and which comes out you know regardless of whether you want it to or not i adore that process um i and it, it happens a lot it happens a lot when you go back to reread work that you haven't encountered for a long time and you realize that oh my god I, I i didn't realize this story was about that or that it was expressing this but it so clearly is it so clearly is about that um i find that to be one of the most engaging and interesting aspects of the whole process where writing becomes a means of self-autopsy or self-dissection um where it, it allows for a kind of therapy where you are expressing to yourself and to others 
in a way that you can't consciously or that it, it wouldn't be as productive for you, it wouldn't be as healthy for you to do so, say, in a conversation or in a literal manner. You're doing it in a sort of metaphorical or abstract way, in an indirect manner. Um, I find that to be absolutely fascinating and I respond to work that does that not all work does there's a lot of work that are, that operates on a very surface level it is just a story and that I'm not that interested in I'm not that keen on but when something is sort of textural and multi-layered and resonant with all of these different factors and feelings and emotions and, and neuroses as well I mean this is something else because it's unconscious you don't always know what you're going to express what's really going to come out and a lot of that stuff is really negative it it's really it's it's not very flattering you know it's it's your hang-ups it's your neuroses it's your problems that are coming out and that is brilliant that is wonderful because of course people are going to respond to that because it's it's a meeting of minds you know everyone else has their neuroses and their hang-ups and their problems too and they whether they know it or not they're looking for that kind of resonance you know they are seeking out that kind of very intimate connection and there is something very intimate about it there's something as intimate as sex or as as anything else any other engagement in this you know you are opening your own mind to invasion by another set of perspectives by another set of ideas you're even allow when you read when you engage with the work of another you're engaging them mind to mind you're actually allowing them access to your own psychological landscapes and you're you are allowing them to transform them to terraform them to other designs to other contexts and that is wonderful that is absolutely brilliant it establishes a certain mutable state of mind which is absolutely the way it should be from a writer's perspective what you're doing is you are asking your readers to give you access to their most sacred internal landscapes to places that lovers generally can't touch that surgeons can't even reach you know their abstract selves the places they wander in their own heads um that are the most sincere expressions of who they are and they you are asking them for permission to set up camp there to, to take up territory there i mean that's a that's a real imposition that's a real fucking ask that is um and it, in that regard there's a sacred duty involved there is a sacred duty involved in the whole process um but when i come back to read my own work like i i came back to re for reasons um that may or may not become apparent later on i went back to read my first short story collection that was published in 2013 uh, strange playgrounds uh, which this podcast is named after and it was a lot of those stories were written over a long period of time. I wrote a lot. I started a lot of them when I was at university, when I was like a twenty-something, and really fucked up. I mean, my my state of mind was fractured and all over the place. I was I was sort of removed from society. I was uh, misanthropic, nihilistic, depressive massively anxious about pretty much everything um i didn't feel included or part of anything i was even sort of like bizarrely dysphoric about being human you know it was a really odd time really strange time um and when i go back to read those stories it it struck me how sort of sincere and how naked a lot of them are how they express those exact concerns but i wasn't really conscious of them doing so at the time or at the time of writing like the 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 title short story strange playgrounds which sort of tops and tails the collection you get the first half at the beginning and the, the last half at the end that the original version of that story is very different. The original story was just designed to be like, I'd recently read uh, Edgar Allan Poe's The Pit and the Pendulum. And I love, I love the setup for that story where you've got a guy who wakes up in like a subterranean vault and it's all sensory because he can't see, it's dark. He can't see where he is. He can hear rats. He can feel the stone at his back. He feels hunger and uncomfortable and confusion and despair. But then it, it explains why he's there and what's going on. I wanted to write a story where it had that set up, but it didn't explain it, where he didn't know what was happening or why he was there. And it became increasingly more abstract as it went on. And that's what Strange Playgrounds is. But reading it back, it became something else. It became this really weird, anxious story about identity and about 
the uh, the fear of being cast adrift, of being abandoned, of being ripped from one's place of comfort, and then of finding a way out that is revelatory, but which is also as terrifying. You know, when you realise that there is no escape from this, there's just like um, an evolution into greater complexity and greater confusion. That's what it became about. And I didn't know that when I was writing it. I didn't know. There's another one in there. There's another one. There's one called The State of Lovers, which is one of a short story I really enjoyed writing. It took me forever to do. And that came out of conversations with a friend of mine, Michelle, and we used to talk about like what would be our ideal lovers, what would be our ideal partners, what bits and pieces of people, physically and in terms of personality, would we take to make into our perfect lovers. And I'd been trying to write the story about that for a long time. Initially it was a kind of hokey, silly, almost Frankenstein parody, but that, that didn't work. So I went back to the drawing board and I wrote this story about a woman who is so frustrated by her partners and her lovers that she dreams a perfect lover into being but then i started to think about that very concept well what does it say about you that you want a perfect lover that you basically want someone who will cater to your every contradiction to your ambiguous whims and desires it says more about you doesn't it about your desire for control and about your anxieties and neuroses than it does about anything else so i start i made the character who she dreams be tortured you know because he can't occupy the ambiguities and contradictions that that flow through her mind at any one time and then she turns that capacity on herself she realizes realizes that what she's done is inflicted a kind of enslavement on him by creating him by dreaming him into being and she has to let him go she has to let him go so he can be his own entity and she turns those transformative capacities on herself because that's what she realizes that she's unhappy in herself it's not to do with him it's nothing that it's it's something that nothing external can fix it's her own state her own sense of identity that is causing the pain and that it was me that was me at the time and it's me it's often me in relationships i have profound issues with relationships as they occur um in a traditional or prescribed way i, I really find them difficult i don't operate well in them um and that's that's that story was an expression of that it's so weird there's another one in there called um storm song and the first half of that was written while I was in like the throw in a really torrid love affair, like a really passionate, torrid, big scale love affair, um, the first half was in the swell of that love affair. And then the second half was written after that love affair collapsed. And it expresses all of the, uh, the emotions, the conflicts, the trauma, the turmoil. But I didn't realize it at the time it's such a strange phenomena and it's something i love it's something i absolutely adore about the entire process and it leads me to want to go back to reread my own work to see what it was expressing you know to see where that subtext is it's nothing i mean when i'm practicing writing when i'm actually sitting down at the keyboard or at, with my pen and paper and scribbling away it's not something i want to be conscious of because i think being conscious of it would ruin it it would make it insincere but to know that it's there to know that that resonance seeps out that is a really cool thing i love that i absolutely love that because I, as i say i think that's what lends stories their texture their detail i think it's what makes them worth reading it's what makes them really toothsome and interesting and it's what allows them to to make lasting impact i really do um so my loves when we come back and that's really all i wanted to say to be perfectly honest when we come back i don't really know what we'll be talking about but i'm sure something new will crop up until then my loves bye bye <laughs> 